Um, good afternoon. We're going to get started. You can keep munching, particularly while I'm talking, but keep g munching after that. I think Shelley's prepared for that. Um, uh, it's great to see you all today for what I'm, I'm kind of sad to say is the last of our WSRP lectures for the year. The year is not over. <laughs> it's really just coming to its um, fullness. We have a lot of time left, but it is the last of our lecture series um, for this year. We will be uh, very shortly within the next um, week announcing next year's research associates. We have a wonderful group coming in uh, next year, and you'll be getting full information about that very, very soon. Um, today, I am really delighted to introduce Professor Shelley Rambo, uh, Assistant Professor of Theology at Boston University School of Theology. She received her doctorate in theology from Emory University's Graduate Division of Religion, and she also has master's degrees from Princeton Theological Sco uh, Seminary and Yale University. Um, she's trained in both systematic and um, constructive theology, uh, and she works in, from a feminist theological perspective. I think you'll see in the work today that she um, does things that go far beyond what those descriptions might suggest in really um, expanding her work to incorporate very practical and sometimes clinical um, uh, ways of thinking about the experience of trauma and how the theological categories relate to to those contemporary human experiences. Um, the title of her talk today is Witnessing Breath Between Death and Life, Reinterpreting Holy Saturday. So. Thank you, Anne, and I want to thank a couple rounds of thanks. Um, first, to the Women's Studies and Religion program. It is sad to be the last lecture. Um, it does feel like the year's coming to a close, and we're all resisting that. Um, but I want to thank um, Anne especially and Caroline and Alex, who are here, uh, for their support. We read each other's work, um, and their um, comments and imprint is on what I have to say today, Laura as well. Um, so I want to thank the Women's Studies and Religion Program. I come in a long legacy of amazing um, feminist and womanist theologians who have come through this program. I'm aware of them, um, Dolores Williams especially, as I'm presenting my talk today. I also want to give a special thanks to Carlo Schmidt, who has been um, helping me translate German. That is no small task, and he'll see some of his work um, hopefully here today. I also want to thank my students. Um, I'm teaching an absolutely amazing class. I don't know if, if you, you stock a class full of um, your best students for, for guest, um, guest lecturers and <laughs> faculty. Um, I'd like to think that. It's, it's, it's been an amazing course, and I want to thank both those students and my students from BU, some of whom are here today, who have shaped a lot of my thinking. What is it that takes place on Holy Saturday? There is a total end and there is a total beginning. But what comes in between them? What is it that persists between death and resurrection? Hans Urs von Balthasar poses this series of questions in a radio address, an address perhaps oddly delivered on Easter Sunday. This 20th century Swiss Catholic theologian asked his listeners to move backwards to the day before the celebration of the resurrection. This is a theological, there is a theological tendency, he says, to glide smoothly over Holy Saturday in the theological busyness and anticipatory moment, movement to Easter Sunday, the central redemptive mo moment in the Christian narrative is missed. But to probe the between, between dying and rising, death and life, cross and resurrection, confronts the theologian with the problem of their own logic. This is his quote. Perhaps it is the problem that the theologians have never attended to, and that, if it were taken seriously, would threaten to throw into confusion all our beautiful Archimedean drawings on paper. So I ask you to go today where Balthazar believes that many theologians fear to tread, 
the theologically underattended but theologically important territory of Holy Saturday. My own work on Holy Saturday begins with an inquiry of Balthazar and his theological partner, Adrian von Speyer, but it does not end there. I have chosen to highlight my constructive work in this talk today, revealing the turn in my research from a study of Holy Saturday and their thought to what I, ad- to what I identify as the middle day, a conceptual territory between death and life. My focus on the constructive turn is twofold. First, because Anne asked us in preparing for these talks to focus on where we're at, write about what you're writing at this moment. And second, because I'm emer- because emerging from any big thinker in order to make constructive claims is excruciating, and sometimes you need witnesses to this emergence. <laughs> this means that I will not be articulating here all the intricacies of Holy Saturday in Balthazar and Spire's thought. I will outline the contours of their Trinita- Trinitarian drama between death and life, drawing attention to the figure of the spirit and positing a pneumatologically rich territory between death and life in the Johannine text. Some of you, but perhaps not all of you, know that my motivating aim is to theologically address the realities of radical suffering as they are expressed, uniquely expressed in the phenomenon of trauma. My development of the middle day is infused with these concerns, as you will see. I've structured my comments around three repetitions of Baltazar's question. What persists between death and resurrection? In the first movement, I'll explore Balthazar and Speyer's response to this question. In the second, I I describe this persistence between death and life by visiting briefly the Gospel of John. In the third, I will link persistence and spirit to the task of witnessing trauma. My thesis, I'm going to give it away, (laughs) between death and life, witness persists. This witness is not only expressed through the figure of the spirit, but is expressed through the breath of witnesses persisting in the middle space. The first movement, what persists between death and life, the Trinitarian drama in hell. Holy Saturday, the liturgical day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, occupied a central place in the theology of Hansers von Balthasar and theological partner Adrian von Speyer. Balthazar acknowledges a biblical silence around Saturday. This is fitting, he says, death calls for this silence. Though the gospel gospel accounts narrate the preparation of the crucified body for burial, the negotiations over the burial site, there is little biblical attention to the between. However, there is a a liturgically and artistically rich lineage of interpretation coming out of this silence. In the Eastern Christian Church, the descent evokes pictures of what is referred to as the harrowing of hell, built upon the reference to Jesus preaching to the dead in 1 Peter 3 and 4. Depictions of Jesus' activity in hell suggest that the victory of the resurrection is already glimpsed and enacted in Jesus' descent. He loosens the chains of the sinners, gathers all the unbelievers, and ascends with them into the resurrection. Balthazar rejects this depiction of the descent. There is no harrowing, no activity. Jesus is dead with the dead in the descent. He he insists on the son's descent as the passive expression of Jesus' redemptive mission. On the cross, the son actively takes on the suffering of the world. In the descent, the son passively experiences death. How does this translate? He dies. There is no activity in death. Balthazar doesn't even like the word descent, given the the movement applied in descending. It is a condition of being dead, not an action. So what motivates this rejection and his insistence on what he calls drawing from Nicholas of Cusa, the second death in the between day? What motivates Balthazar to develop Holy Saturday is inarguably the presence of Adrian von Speyer and her visions of Holy Saturday. For 25 years, between 1941 and 1965, around the time of Holy Week, Speyer would enter into a period of intense suffering, what she and Balthazar would describe as charisms or gifts that she offered to the church. 
Baltazar, present with her during these journeys to hell, was unable to provide her any assistance. During this time, a rather perplexing process of dictation persisted between them. In his absence, uh, in his absence at these times, she committed to writing them down immediately after her experiences. It was clear to both of them that these visions would serve the purposes of a broader theological project. What she saw was theologically significant and illuminated the Paschal mystery. The question of the degree to which these visions impact his reading of Holy Saturday, the degree to which they need to be theologically considered, and whether his motivations really matter at all, has generally been met with a certain degree of theological hesitation and silence. A good example of this is the most recently published book by Alyssa Pitstick on Baltazar's descent to hell and Catherine in Catholic doctrine. She eschews any discussion of his pers- personal motivations, allowing her as a standard to write off the presence of Adrian von Speyer and her contributions to the theology of Holy Saturday. The book is 400 pages of impressive, but very little mention of um, von Speyer. His motivations, I contend, matter. A good portion of his descriptions of the descent rely heavily on her visions of what is taking place. This is seen um, most prominently in Theodrama 5, where he says, he explains at the beginning, where he pulls sections of, um, of her accounts and places them straight into um, his systematic text. The drama comes alive into full expression in her visions. No approach to Holy Saturday, he writes in the introduction to Krudzenhul, a comprehensive account of her yearly visions and thematic summaries of them, no approach to Holy Saturday has brought convincing unity until now. Amidst the modern ethos of God is dead, Speyer's visions bring not only the most fitting theological synthesis, but a meaningful answer to the existential crisis. This is Balthazar's comments. Speyer's visions begin in 1941, only months after her conversion to Catholicism. It was as if a dam broke, releasing a flood of supernatural experiences. This is in the 1941 vision. What called Balthazar's attention to Holy Saturday was a distinctive shift in her experiences from Good Friday to Holy Saturday. He writes, In the afternoon on Friday, as I had suspected, at 3 p.m., the suffering came to an end. I had expected that relief would follow, but something else completely different came. This something was her entrance into an internal condition more severe than anything she had experienced. The suffering was not so much physical as psychological. Unlike her participation in Christ's sufferings in the Passion, she describes what is taking place here as non-participation. Holy Saturday was expressed through a variety of things that were withheld from her, communication, movement, and communion. On this Saturday, she says, no one can ever commune. A great weariness overtook her, powerlessness, helplessness, and fear. Many of her visions feature a sense of borderlessness, symbolized in a river of thick mud that would always threaten to drown her, a river of pain and suffering that could not be contained. There was also no direction, no paths in hell. No endings and no beginnings, Spire is drawn into the sun's deep alienation, at many points likening it to the experience of abandonment by one's lover. The existential force of this picture is compelling, bearing the character and the vocabulary of the novelists and poets who ranked in Balthazar's estimation amongst the best theologians. Uh, Alienation, forsakenness, despair, Jean-Paul Sartre, Paul Claudel, Goethe. Holy Saturday represents a rich landscape marked by profound absence. Speyer's experiences this abandoned, but also strangely becomes witness to a mystery disclosed in hell. The sun descending to the dead experiences what it is to be abandoned. On the cross, the Lord died to give life. This is a quote from Speyer. On the cross, the Lord died to give life. Here, she reports, There is no life anymore. Everything is dead and thrown away. The river returns again in the 1945 account. 
Here, the sun must go into it in order to comprehend it. These contrasts between cross and Holy Saturday appear throughout her visions. In hell, the son is being inducted into the secret of the father. What has been withheld from the son up, up to this point was a vision of sin and what she repeatedly refers to as the darkness of the father, godly wrath that crushes sin. This is the visio mortis that the son receives in hell. The importance of Holy Saturday for both of them lies in the revelation of God's solidarity with humanity in hell. The sun descends to the most forsaken place. There is no place and no experience that God does not know. God even knows God forsakenness. The victory of Holy Saturday is not the victorious conquering of death, but instead the son's experience of death without the resurrection in sight. The picture of harrowing, he thinks, robs us of that, anticipating life before life arises. But the significance of Holy Saturday is difficult difficult for them to translate into the life or for the life of Christian believers. It's very clear that a model of what they call Christian witness, what some might term discipleship, that this model of Christian witness from Good Friday means that one is called to imitate the obedience of Christ, which includes his suffering even to the point of death. The model for for Christian witness is the crucified Christ, whose love is best demonstrated in his willing obedience to die on behalf of others. This becomes as well the model of life for the Christian believer. Martyrdom, Martyrdom, he writes, means bearing witness. The connection between martyrdom and the cross is not altered or significantly affected by the development of the descent into hell. With a strong Christocentrism undergirding their Trinitarian reading of hell, imitating the son's condition becomes the basis by which they interpret the faithfulness of Christian life. Their gaze in hell remains on the figure of the son, who dying on the cross is now dead in the depths of hell. The call to witness is a call to enter into the sufferings of Christ. But given the uniqueness of Saturday, it is now an intensified call. It requires being called to enter into the sufferings in an extreme way. Some receive a share in these sufferings, they say, but it's increasingly clear that only few, like Speyer, can really enter in. Yet in the midst of their vivid descriptions of the father's son alienation, where is the spirit? Although they insist that the descent is a Trinitarian event, there is little mention of the third, What role does the spirit play in this drama? The spirit is the bond of love, uniting the father and the son at the point of their greatest distance. So the picture you have again and again in their thought is the father and son at the farthest distance. And how is this kept together with the spirit? The spirit holds and binds together the two in the descent, preserving their love at the point where it is most threatened. They offer little more than this, their gaze clearly on the father and son relation. Some of this is due to the deeply Christocentric character of their thought. Some is due to the fact that Adrian identifies with the son in the descent, so the richest descriptions are located there. Alyssa Pitstick notices the silence and says that Balthazar sees no need to mention spirit because spirit is the love between the father and the son. Speaking of the dynamics between the two is sufficient. But is it? At the point of alienation, the spirit links them, ensuring their unity while marking their distance. But it is less clear why their depiction of the spirit is so static at this point, why the spirit ho- spirits holding together has so little character or texture. What do I mean? Balthazar does, at points, adhere to an Augustinian understanding of the spirit as the bond between the father and son. That's what you hear in place in their descriptions of the descent. But his pneumatology diverges from this as well. Though he never strays from Nicene orthodoxy, there are some variations on the role of the spirit that reflect a much more textured understanding of the spirit within the Trinity. My question is why, at this point, the spirit maintains, preserves, and binds, rather than, in other cases, the spirit searches the depths of the Godhead or reveals the surprise between the Father and the Son. Why is the spirit as love not witness to the alienation between father and son? 
All of these latter points express dimensions of the love between father and son through the figure of the spirit and are expressed at other points in Balthazar's work, even in Speyer's Johannine commentaries. What interests me is not that there is minimal attention to the spirit in their thought, but then when, when presented, the spirit takes on this particular character. Why is this description employed at this point? The nature of the spirit in the descent is shaped, I believe, by a theological debate about divine suffering in which Balthazar is increasingly engaged. He prefaces the second edition of Mysterium Pascal, his study on the Triduum, with his concern about what he calls the fashionable talk about the pain of God. At issue is the nature of divine suffering, and Jürgen Moltmann and process theologians are key figures in these debates. These are debates that are going right around in the the late 70s, early 80s. Um, Balthazar believed that Moltmann's claim that God takes suffering into God's being, his reading of the crucifixion in the crucified God, compromises the character of God. According to Balthazar, the divine drama is rendered a tragedy in the hands of Moltmann. Balthazar argues that the divine life is affected by the suffering of the Son, but he does not want to ascribe suffering to God's being. It makes sense that Holy Saturday is instrumental in these debates. In the descent, Balthazar depicts the divine at the point of dissolution. The father and son are completely alienated from one another, but the divine situation is preserved, is not rendered a divine tragedy because of the spirit. The spirit keeps the Godhead from tragically severing. The result is the securing of the figure of the spirit precisely as the figure that secures, allowing Balthazar to walk a fine line between professing divine suffering and preserving the divine being. What persists between death and life for Balthazar and Speyer is the drama between father and son in which divine love is preserved in the darkness of hell. But in the process, the spirit's role as witness between death and life is elided. This persistence of the spirit between death and life takes shape in the Johannine Gospel. It is this persistence that transforms the picture of divine solidarity in the descent into a critical sight of the spirit's witness between death and life. Breath. Second movement. And water. Both pneumatological images. Could you talk about? What persists between death and life? Although I noted earlier that the gospel account of the period between cross and resurrection is filled with burial preparations and negotiations, the Johannine text provides distinctive testimony to the spirit between death and life. I assure the biblical scholars present that I pose no threat to their job security. I do, however, want to reclaim a tradition of biblical theology in a postmodern vein. This means that I aim not only to emphasize the rhetorical power of the text, but to defamiliarize and reintroduce these texts in order to reveal their significance for contemporary theological reflection. On the cross, Jesus breathes his last breath. The Johannine text describes this exhalation a bit differently than the other Gospels. The text reads, he bows his head and gives up his spirit. The Greek term paradokin translates here as to give up. It, uh, translated in um, English translation as to give up, it means to hand over. In death, Jesus hands over his spirit. This term is used several times in the gospel, giving extra significance to Jesus' exhalation. It's used, for example, when Pilate releases Jesus to the officials for execution. He hands him over. There are five references to handing over in this exchange with Pilate, and it ends in this moment of the cross where Jesus hands himself over. This is in um, John 18 and 19. But the handing over here begs the question of what Jesus is handing over and to whom. The use of paradokin begs the question of reception. Who is receiving this spirit, this death breath? There is a more formal giving of the spirit to the disciples that evening narrated in the later text, John 20, 22. After Je- there's a later, uh, more formal giving after Jesus' re- resurrection, identified as the Pentecost moment in the Johannine text. 
But there's something curious about this prior handing over of spirit. There's general hesitation to identify this moment as the giving of the Holy Spirit, given the fact that this takes place later in the evening. Some scholars describe this handing over as a special gift given to those standing at the foot of the cross. This spirit released in his expiration is not recognized as the Holy Spirit, but is there pneumatological significance to this release? Jesus' spirit is handed over on the cross, but where does it go? It is handed over, but is it received? We're already on rich pneumatological territory in this gospel. In the farewell discourse preceding the Passion, Jesus has already described post-crucifixion life for the disciples in terms of the figure of the Spirit. He promises them that in his absence, he will send the parakletos, or the paraclete, to be with them. I am leaving you, he says, but you will not be abandoned. I will send you the paraclete, the advocate, to be with you. Accompanying this figure of the paraclete is the Greek verb meno, to abide, to remain, to endure, that describes the unique relationship of this paraclete spirit, that the um, relationship that this paraclete spirit will have with the disciples. There is also in the aftermath of the cross the curious piercing of Jesus' side. This post-death wound produces, you might recall, a strange mixture of blood and water. Water throughout the Johannine Gospel and letters is a symbol of spirit and newness. Here, mixed with blood, newness seems to be emerging from the site of death. Balthazar has a reading of this Johannine wound. I'll mention a little bit at the end. The wound of death is, in the Johannine text, strangely alive. These post-death instructions handed over to the disciples before the death makes clear that the spirit here described in the unique form of the paraclete will persist in and through them. These three, paraclete, meno, and the wound, all tie as well to the concept of witness. The paraclete is sent to testify to the things that Jesus has said. This paraclete will empower their testimony in the courtrooms of the world. This paraclete will meno, remain, abide, and as you can tell, I'm suggesting persist in the disciples, empowering them to witness in Jesus' absence. The ooze of liquid from the wound of Jesus is witnessed by a disciple. His testimony and its truth, the text says, prompts belief in those who follow. In the farewell discourse, it's unclear when this paraclete will arrive and how closely this figure will be associated with the Holy Spirit. In the discourse, Jesus is referred to as another paraclete. And in chapter 14, he refers to the paraclete as the Holy Spirit. He tells them, You will know the paraclete because he abides with you and will be in you. This paraclete will take up residence in the disciples following Jesus' death. The nature of this presence is less clear given the multiple meanings of the term to exhort, encourage, to comfort, and to appeal. He is the promise of continued presence, commentators say. This spirit provides something of Jesus' presence despite his absence from them. But is the paraclete not also witness to the absence of Jesus? They will carry forward not something of his presence, but they will carry forward something of his absence as well. Through the paraclete, they are both linked to the past, what they know of Jesus, and linked to the future, what they will carry forward in the wake of his death. Their witness, however, bears the mark of an absence. I'm asking you to turn a bit here as I query this interpretation of continued presence. This continued presence will be defined through the event of death. This promise comes to the disciples before the death, but the presence will be experienced, will will be not be experienced simply as the continuation of Jesus' presence. This presence will be redefined through an event that has yet to occur. This assurance of Jesus brings with it also the reality that they will bear something of this death death within them. He hands over his spirit in the territory between death and life. In this post-death testimonial landscape, there is a distinctive expression of spirit in the aftermath of the cross that cannot simply be equated with the formal giving and receiving of the spirit in John 20, 22. 
This distinctive ex expression has already been forecasted in the farewell discourse in which Jesus tells the disciples that the nature of their lives will be shaped in relationship to the event of death they have not yet experienced. Life will take different form, he tells them, and the figure of the per paraclete and the activity of abiding, meno, reveals a different configuration of life in the aftermath of death. This paraclete spirit persists within them, powering them to testify to all the things that Jesus has done. What we have in the Johannine text is a rich landscape of witnessing forecasted in the farewell discourse and enacted in the aftermath of the cross. There is a figure of divine persistence, the paraclete, but this persistence now takes the form of witness in the bodies of the disciples. The death breath released on the cross becomes in them the possibility of witness birthed in the aftermath. This witness is not simply the breath of resurrection life breathed in them at the Pentecost moment. I'm suggesting that there is a breath preceding this formal breath, a handing over and reception that is more tenuous. What would it mean to give theological significance to this breath? Movement three. What persists between death and life? What does it mean to witness? What form does witness take in the aftermath of death? The term trauma refers to an event or events that overwhelm the whole person, rendering a person unable to respond to threat. Due to the force of violence, a person's ability to adapt is severely hampered. This overwhelming, often referred to as flooding, results in the loss of the body and psyche's ability to properly store and access memories. The problem of integrating a traumatic event, of recording it and classifying it, results in its return, best known through Freud's early observations of veterans' flashbacks. Images of the event, fragments of it, invade the present, literally placing the body once again in that initial state of threat. Life for someone who is traumatized becomes organized around that event. The challenge of healing, of integrating the event rather than reliving it, is not only a challenge to individuals but to communities. We can even see the dynamics of trauma enacted in national and international levels. What is unresolved about the past returns and the cycles of violence are doomed to be repeated. Walter Benjamin and Robert J. Lifton are two pivotal think thinkers who interpret history as traumatically structured. That's another talk. Although there is much debate about traumatic healing, whether it can be achieved and by what means, there is general, general agreement that witnessing is a or the critical link to healing. In the devastating New York Times article this weekend about trauma and women soldiers in the Iraq war, the journalist repeatedly refers to the isolation of these women who have experienced what she identifies as the double whammy of military sexual trauma and combat exposure. Judith Herman, in her pivotal text, Trauma and Recovery, identifies the problem of trauma in this radical disconnection. In trauma, one loses one's basic sense of trust, meaning, and well-being in the world. The key to traumatic recovery, this writer speculates and Herman claims, is reconnection. Recovery can only take place, she writes, within the context of relationships. It cannot occur in isolation. For Herman, the therapeutic relationship provides the first step in reconnection in which the therapist witnesses to the survivor's experience and the ongoing experience of living beyond it. In all forms of witness literature, post-Holocaust accounts, narratives of sexual abuse and racial violence, and in the growing literature of global trauma, both the impossibility of witness and the necessity of it are simultaneously articulated. Witnessing trauma is complex, involving, in most cases, attesting to multiple layers and structures of violence that increase one's susceptibility and exposure to traumatic events. To witness entails contending with silences, gaps in memory, and existing prohibitions about unearthing the event, whether internal prohibitions like guilt and shame or external ones such as institutional structures that perpetuate silencing. The violent event, even if it can be voiced, should not be. 
Cloud Lonsman, the filmmaker of Shoah, has the most stunning comments on this prohibition. In the wake of the Holocaust, all physical traces of the violence were to be erased, making it even more difficult to locate a past event and integrating into it into one's present. How can one witness in the absence of evidence? Lonsman attempts through the visual medium to witness the geography of the Holocaust and the horrors and silences that the very landscape speaks. The commitment to witnessing, the necessity of it, grows out of the dangers of keeping these experiences hidden, of keeping them contained and unvoiced. I want to highlight here two aspects of witnessing trauma that are particularly significant for my theological expansion of the concept of witness. First, witnessing involves testifying to an absence. I draw this phrase from Dory Laub's essay, Bearing Witness or the Vicissitudes of Listening, in which he describes the process of bearing witness as testifying to an absence in the survivor's narrative. A psychoanalyst and Holocaust survivor, Laub was one of the instrumental figures in establishing the Yale Video Archives of Holocaust Testimonies and he's contributed a great deal to our understanding of the dynamics of speaking and listening to survivor accounts. The one who listens to trauma, he says, participates in, a, in an event that has yet to come into existence. What Laub means by this is that something of the initial experience of trauma, the actual event, was not known in its actual occurrence, but comes into knowledge through the process of witnessing. He writes, Knowledge in the testimony is not simply a factual given that's reproduced and replicated by the testifier, but a genuine advent, an advent in its own right. You can imagine then the demands on listening. A listener, he says, must listen to and hear the silence in the testimony, recognizing that the silence bears the traces of an unimaginable occurrence. What is often not explored is the effect of this process on the listener, I'm going to give you a quote from Laub. Trauma and its impact on the hearer leaves indeed no hiding place intact. As one comes to know the survivor, one really knows, really comes to know oneself, and this is not a simple task. The survivor experience is a very condensed version of what most of life is all about. It contains a great many existential questions that we manage to avoid in our daily living, often through preoccupation with trivia, end of quote. Now, I could spend my remaining moments reflecting on Laub's comment, but his point is that the, the listener cannot remain aloof and still be a witness to trauma. Something of that event, both what is known and what is not known of it, is being handed over in the process of witnessing. It is this transmission this handing over of what is not fully known that adds weight to the reception of this testimony. This weight of reception, the act of bearing witness, leads me to my second point, the very embodiment of witness. So my second point, witness involves the body. The body keeps the score has become the mantra of Bessel van der Kolk, a leading researcher on the neurobiology of trauma. His claims about trauma in the body are strongly delivered and often contested. Trauma is experienced primarily, he claims, through bodily sensations experienced in the limbic system and bypasses the cognitive processing area of the brain, the frontal lobe. He launches a strong critique of talk therapy, believing that the clinical obsession with recovering the story of the past, of the past trauma, has not contributed to healing. We have missed the central truth of trauma, the fact that trauma comes to live in our bodies. This means that therapists should start targeting the frontal lobe, or should stop targeting the frontal lobe, the cognitive processing reasoning center of the brain, and start instead to focus on strength, strengthening their client's ability to self-regulate her or his body. Traumatic healing can only come about by increasing awareness of one's bodily responses noting when the world presents sensory triggers, and engaging in practices like breathing, yoga, drama, and art that not only help the body to center, but also help the body to synchronize with other bodies. His emphasis on somatic memory is not new. You can find it in the work, well articulated in the work of Peter Levine. But Vander Kolk is, pri is its primary evangelist. 
The reconnection that Judith Herman insists upon takes a radically embodied form in Van der Kolk's work. Witness literally takes the form of breath. A clinician can do this through re-engaging her, his own breath, and moving the client through breathing exercises. For Van der Kolk, it means that the clinician needs to be a good body reader and must usher the client into practices of re-establishing their bodily safety. Recognition of the non-linguistic dimension of witnessing is critical, given not only the neurobiology that Van der Kolk highlights, but the perplexing, perpetual issue of the intergenerational transmission of trauma. An example, how does a, tra- how does a daughter manifest bodily symptoms of her mother's trauma, a trauma which has never been voiced by the mother? This phenomenon says something about the bodily communication taking place in nonverbal forms. Attention to this bodily dimension provides impetus to rethink our physical presence with each other and the ways in which our bodies both contain the violence that we experience and transmit their uncontainable realities. Shortness of breath, irregular and uncontrolled breath, signal threat, harm, and powerlessness, but deep rhythmic breath can reestablish safety, groundedness, (coughs) and empowerment. So my conclusion, what persists? I will make two sets of comments about the significance of my project, tying hopefully the three to somewhat um, some coherence. The first, the question of redemption in Christianity. The second, the question of theological language. Christian witness, as interpreted by Balthazar and Speyer, takes the form of suffering, a patterning one's life after the radical obedience of Jesus. This Christ-like obedience, referred to as cadaver obedience, is modeled by Speyer, who enters into the Paschal Mystery. Her identification with Christ is extreme on Holy Saturday. This theology of martyrdom has been deeply criticized rather than heralded by many feminist and womanist theologians, amongst others. Scholars such as Dolores Williams, Jacqueline Grant, Rita Nakashima Brock, directly challenged this understanding of the cross and the problematic patterning of life based upon a model of redemptive suffering. Calling women into lives of suffering through a reiteration of a substitutionary theology of the cross renders the Christian message toxic rather than liberative. They point to other places in the Christian narrative, locating redemption in the life and ministry of Jesus, Williams' ministerial vision, or in the post-resurrection Emmaus account, Rita Nakashima Brock's reworking of the Feast of Epiphany. I am locating, like Balthazar and Speyer, the central redemptive moment in the narrative between death and resurrection. Unlike them, I do not see the, see the key movement of redemption in the, sun, in the extension of the son's suffering, but rather in witness to the suffering. There is a danger in glorifying the suffering on the cross, but there is also a danger in moving the redemptive focus away from suffering altogether, This movement, I think, maintains rather than contends with problematic associations between cross and suffering. The move from cross to middle day does not turn away from the suffering, but instead positions us in a certain relationship to that suffering, a witness position. In her Introduction to Trauma, Explorations and Memory, Kathy Carruth claims that trauma brings each of the disciplines to the limits of our understanding. Across many of the disciplines, we are beginning to hear each other anew in the study of trauma because, she says, we're listening through the radical disruptions and gaps of traumatic experience. Through increasing engagement with clinicians, through understanding something a little more about the neurobiology of trauma, and through continued readings in literature and history, I'm not only drawn into new conversation, but drawn back into the religious texts with new force. What would it mean to reread, for example, the biblical call, You Will Be My Witnesses, or the Johannine Departure Discourse in light of the two aspects of witness that I've just presented? Reading the gospel text, I'm struck by the stark question, Who wants to be a witness? You see, the demands of Christian witness are often explained as carrying one's cross, of sacrificing one's life. But what, I'm call- what, but what I'm claiming is that the demands of witness shift on the middle day to the figure of spirit and to the movement of witnessing in the aftermath of death. A call to witness pattern from this pneumatological site gives rise to a deeply embodied process of bearing witness to the emergence of life in the wake of death. This pneumatological beginning displaces the call to suffer, 
replacing it with a call to witnessing suffering and, more importantly, to witnessing newness in its wake. Second, I ask you to return for a moment to the bold claim of Balthazar that Holy Saturday threatens to throw into confusion all the theologians' Archimedean drawings. We are confronted in this day between, Balthazar says, with a logic problem. It's not only the presence of Adrian von Speyer on this day that presented a threat to theologians. It was Balthazar's literary articulation of this day that presented a threat as well. In his treatment of the descent to hell, Balthazar is, in Anne Hunt's words, at his most imaginative and perhaps also at his most controversial. Balthazar's first attempt to write a theology of Holy Saturday was in 1943, in Heart of the World, a strange text that reads more like poetry than systematic theology. Intended as a commentary on the Gospel of John, he inserts Holy Saturday at the site of this post-death wound and the liquid ooze. Is this death, he writes, trickling on in impotence, unconsciously, laboriously making its way towards a new creation that has not yet, that does not yet even exist? This text was poorly received by his theological contemporaries. Many thought it was too elitist and definitely too literary. But it remained one of Balthazar's favorite texts, and he returned to it again and again, believing that his whole theology could be cont- was contained within it. It is a testimonial work that reflects his parallel attempts to witness the Passion narrative in the Johannine text and in the body of Adrian von Speyer on Holy Saturday. How do you write Holy Saturday? How do you testify to this day that is marked by absence, that in his words holds a deathly silence? This, I think, was the question that he struggled with. Theologic is not sufficient for it. Rebecca Chopp begs this question as well about theologic in, in her article, Theology and the Poetics of Testimony, in which she asked the think their discourse in light of the genre of witness. The truth-telling that emerges in witness literature challenges theologians to rethink the parameters of what constitutes truth. Does theology provide room, she asks, for such truth-telling, especially when the truths of violence cannot be clearly or straightforwardly articulated? And can theology in its very discourse attest to the silenced and silencing truths of human shattering by violent events? She calls for a new form of theology. James Cone, earlier in the year, standing in the Sperry room down the hall, called us to see the cross and the lynching tree together. He calls us to witness the horrors of these events, but he also more jarringly, perhaps, calls us to see the beauty in the cross, the transformation that takes place there. Theologians, he said, need active imaginations to see the beauty. It's interesting that Cohn doesn't say that we need to get our atonement theories lined up or that we have to get our logic straight. It's tough, he says, to find the right language to talk about a terrible thing, he says. The tragic memory is still waiting for theological meaning. Cohn's charge to theologians was not a charge on the level of logic, but a charge to get some imagination. It's going to take a lot of imagination, he says, to discover life and death and hope and tragedy. The call for imagination may at first sound trite in the midst of unspeakable horrors of trauma, but this is not frivolous imagination. The search for different ways of speaking, the struggle with the limits and forms of language, is necessary precisely given the loss of language that marks the experience of many survivors. Imagination is necessary because there's no way, clear way forward no clear life ahead, no resurrection. I'm placing Chop and Cone in the middle day, but they are already there, I think, in their call for new forms of language and new discourses of witness. What persists between death and life? From Holy Saturday comes a powerful depiction, not of the victory of life over death or even the solidarity of God and human suffering, but the persistence of witnesses in the place where life cannot yet be glimpsed. Thank you. model what I talked about. <laughs> the shortness of breath the whole time. Do you want to take a few breaths before you take questions? <laughs> sure, I'll take um, Yeah. Shelley will take questions. We do have um, about 25 minutes. And I recognize there needs to be an exodus. Uh, yeah. Some people, people need, need to, to go to class or other things.
Um, from what I'm understanding, and I could be not interpreting what you're saying right, is that this middle grade becomes where we can become redeemed, right? But is this, are you talking specifically about those who are witnessing trauma are the ones that get redeemed? What about the, the ones who are traumatized? Like, are you saying that this middle day is, is how a traumatized person becomes redeemed? Is it the middle day? Um, it's a layering of questions and it's really beautiful. I mean, I'm from the from the Christian narrative, there are certain, I mean, the whole Christian narrative, life, death, resurrection, is a redemption narrative. Um, so what I'm, but I think theologians, what they have, have centered on certain er- areas or aspects of that story, like Williams is relocating um, to the life and ministerial vision of Jesus. So, um, but the death has been the primary locus where people say redemption happens on that cross. Now, Balthazar, what I, what's interesting about him was he says, no, actually, there's, there's some extension of what happens on the cross, and redemption happens, he's locating it in the middle day. And I'm, I'm thinking, what does that relocation mean? Um, so, so I want to take a step back to say um, that we all, that, that Christian believers take something of that story and um, identify something some, that narrative in relationship to their own lives that, that has some kind of shaping power. Um, that s- someone like Rita Brock was saying the narrative with that death-centered focus, it, when read from the, from the um, perspective of survivors, um, it's somehow glorifying that suffering and um, claiming something, uh, validating it, not only validating but glorifying it. And so what would it mean um, so that, okay, I'm trying to get at all the kind of layers of your question. So I think um, I take seriously that critique and think about how, how um, I read this story through the lens of trauma. And what I initially heard in Holy Saturday was the language of trauma. So when I was reading Baltazar's descriptions, when I was reading and reading trauma narratives simultaneously, it's all of the kind of language of the, the crisis of survival, the crisis of, of the survivor, is not the crisis on the cross of the death. It's the question of whether whether survival, whether one can live on. So the question of trauma for me has, is, is the question of living on. And that question, I think, is theologically addressed on the middle day. Um, that the question of whether there's life ahead what, there's, a, there's a death and then there's life, but the question of this space becoming a site, um, if it's over, it's, it's usually read over in theology, like you don't even think about Holy Saturday, but what would it be to mark this space? Well, I think what Baltazar does is he kind of does exactly what Rita Brock would say, you know, you're, you're doing that, but you're just doubling it. Um, so I think what I'm, okay, I'm going to go out there and say I'm, I'm introducing what I think is really a kind of co-redemptive process that there's redemption is ongoing, um, that it's narrated in that event, in that divine event, um, but that we participate in that event if we take seriously as believers um, that take seriously that Johannine text that what we're handed over um, is that call to be witness, then we also participate in redemption. Um, so I, I want to say redemption is narrated in that event, but it's not done there, um, and that it's something ongoing. Does that is that yeah, help? I was yeah. trying to back up a little bit to give. Yeah, I, to knew give that, I knew that you were trying to take the focus away from the cross, mm-hmm. which is, is important. But then I was just sort of like, well, I didn't know what the middle day was. If that was supposed to be like the center now, or but yeah, but I, I mean, what you're saying is the process, the whole process. So it's well, just the, going but but where we pay attention in the narrative, I mean, this has been that it's been an overlooked day, and Baltazar kind of gives it significance, I think, for the wrong reason. And the question is how to recover what I think is importance of that day. I think um, someone like Walter Brueggemann has a beautiful little essay on in his po- one of the post-Holocaust um, how to read the Bo- New Testament after the Holocaust. And he has this beautiful little essay on the pause of Saturday. So that often, so people are recovering it in light of, he's someone who's like recovering it in light of devastating horror and saying, 
well, this gives a delay. He's saying there's a pause or delay that has to happen to recognize the kind of significance of that death and, and to not rush to the good news. And I want to say the, the quest, resurrection is the question mark for trauma survivors. And that I, it's not only a pause, I want to say to Brueggemann, it's a kind of disruption in the whole relationship between death and life. So that you're always kind of thrown back into the death in some kind of, the past and present, death and life can't be so easily delineated. And I think Holy Saturday gives a place to witness that kind of confusing mixture. That, and I think it's in the Johan, I hear it in the narrative of the Johannine text, is that you're always in some kind of relationship both to the past and the question of the future shaped by a past. Um, I can answer your other two questions, do you do it? Okay. <laughs> say like successful witness which means really um, well I think I think resurrection would be the continual process of it's right here Shelley. yeah it's, it's right in Angela's tattoo um, <laughs> but it's the continual pro- process of of uh, of witness uh, t- to the See, this is the hardest. Whenever, whenever I get to questions of resurrection, I'm like, ah. Um, I'm just happy because people will say, because you know, I'm just thinking of, like, I'm thinking people, you know, who, who have a very strong sense of Jesus' bodily resurrection. <laughs> you know I mean, so then, what would you like? How would you speak to that? Well, okay, so I would. Um, the wound remains. I mean, you also have in the biblical text that the, that the wound is not gone. That there's the marks are still there, and there's some, that, that's some powerful resurrection attest, attesting is that the wounds remain, and that they're always a reminder. Um, so I could do a really interesting, <laughs> I think, reading of what the a resurrection from taking that wound. Um, I haven't done it yet, but or you could do it. Not even. I mean, it was it was like four months after her conversion. So I'm wondering what the relationship is between her experiences during Holy Week and any previous ex- uh, trauma she may have experienced, and if in fact her uh, descent into these moments is in some way her way of witnessing something that may have happened in her own life, mm-hmm. and that that ability to bear witness then is her resurrection. Oh, that's a really nice. Um, uh, yeah, you don't really. I I don't really get a sense of. There's no narrated um, trauma in her in her past. That doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, she's the. I mean, it's the hardest for me to make the link back. I thought I was going to find in reading all this. Um, in it shows the danger of constructive work because I thought when I went in there I was going to find um, something. Something un- I mean, her these visions are unusual, um, like very unusual, um, and his presence there is absolutely puzzling. But it's very clear to me that she sees these visions as um, it's like nothing else I've ever read before. That she sees them serving this purpose of the theology, mm-hmm. and. And that the fact is that there's an active conversation that she has just going on all the time about um, kind of like recognizing that she has to articulate the son, what's going on with the son, because you've got to figure out the father-son relationship. I mean, it's it's almost feels constructed. It's not, I know, but um, but to think of her of her entrance into that. I mean, I I, I thought so much about about the witness between the two of them 
the kind of an actment that goes on between them. There's some kind of bodily witness going going on, but I haven't thought about it exclusive it in terms of resurrection. So I'd have to. Do you have some ideas? <laughs> you know, if I can follow along to that question. I've heard you present this material so many times and I never heard 1942 before as the date of her conversion and the beginning of these visions. And so I wonder if the trauma would necessarily need to be her personal. Yeah. Well, trauma. part of the visions, are, it's actually interesting because she does take travels too. I mean, at certain points you have Holocaust imagery that that is evoked in those visions so that she sees a like <coughs> likening um, to the, this experience of hell as I mean it's the more that the more that I understand the more that I read their works it, it evokes both the kind of literary um, the existentialist language but going on the literary kind of landscape sounds very much like um, Camus <laughs> but also she does get specific visions of of hell as a, a kind of visiting a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. So she travels in these, she does take journeys to different devastating sites in these visions. So you're right, it doesn't have to be her own, her own trauma, but that she's a cognizant that something, that this descent is likened to different radical experiences of suffering taking place around. You look even more like, why did you tell me this uh, before? I, yeah, I, well, I mean, it sounds like she's a kind of um, post Holocaust theologian um, yeah, trying to think about God in the death camps. Yeah, and that would not be how she would articulate herself at all. But, um, I mean, what she, I mean, her inspiration for, for some of her visions is that she practices Ignatian exercises so that she's got that going on a very strong um, you know she's, she's actually receiving commentary I, I don't want mean to feature all her, her bizarre qualities but she's receiving commentary on the Gospel of John so you can actually read in the end of her library she has volumes of, of commentary um, that she was without theological Theological education would seem to just receive these vision, these um, straightforward kind of reading of the Johannine text. So she would bring the Johannine text out, and she would just talk to Baltazar, um, and he would write them down. So you have extensive, and a lot of them are very similar to her vision. So you get the kind of visions going on with her trying to interpret uh, interpret um, what's going on in the Johannine text. Mm -hmm. So. And he, they both believe that this is the gift that she's elucidating, illuminating um, what's already in the Johannine text. So all of all of the theology kind of kind of is an attempt to more deeply um, excavate the gospel, gospel of John. I have a question on the issue of witness. Now, there's um, from your presentation, I, I really remember a lot about Christianity, but there's this question of witness. Right in Christianity, mm -hmm. and then there is this branch in psychology where bearing witness is a form of therapy. Is there an end? Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to make sense of is that you have this whole. Um, you have this whole language of, of Christian min witness and what it means to witness, because Jesus calls his disciples to be witnesses in my. It's from the Johannine text. You will be witnesses in my name. So the whole question of what has witness been in Christianity, and. You know, you could say a couple of things. I mean, one, I gave you a model of, of that witness is a kind of imitation of, of the life of Christ. The other model that's very um, prominent would be a kind of proclamation model that you go and proclaim the things that Jesus has said. So it becomes almost a, a, a apologetic or an evangelistic model of witness. So I'm really so so what you what you have is this this kind of interpretation of witness in Christianity, and then when you read the witness literature you have the same terms used of bearing witness, um, being a witness. And, and I, so I take these and say, well, they, they don't seem to be correlating at all. 
So what I've done is to take this witness literature and to say, what does it mean to be one who bears witness? To bears and bears witness to the death of Jesus, which is what death and life and resurrection of Jesus. But also I said, what impact does that have on the way that we understand the, the, the many deaths that we witness? I mean, I think that's the best form of Christianity when you take that text and you say, okay, how is that text then to be read in a contemporary context? And all of a sudden I hear this bearing witness language and I say, well, maybe it has to do not with a kind of proclamation model or evangelism model, but that it's a way of, of being present um, in, a, in a pretty profoundly different way with people in, in suffering. So the witness is usually tied to some event of, of suffering um, in, the, in the gospel text. But I, I'm claiming a, a kind of a texture to that witness that I think brings the best of clinical insights. The, the, what I'm hearing from, from the trauma discourse and clinicians, what they're doing with their clients or what, how they're understanding the work that they do is very much a work of bearing witness. And I want to say, what, how does that change my theological understanding of that term, which I get hit with over and over again And if I read the gospel text? Is, you will be my witnesses. You'll call to testify. You will be persecuted. Disciples will be persecuted, but you're called to witness in my name. So I really am trying to take that language um, and see how the two can kind of mutually inform each other. Um, well, she survived. How, how did you make your link? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that well, I think... I would say that's Shelley's contribution. I don't think I'm the only one who does it. But, but I think in terms of the trauma literature... Um, that I that I um, in terms of the trauma literature, I'm trying to give texture to that term theologically, based on what I hear in in um, from survivors, from clinicians, from being a person who lives in the world where you know to many many degrees violence is presented daily. So, what does it mean to witness kind of everyday violence? What does it mean to witness trauma? I, I just thought theologically this concept of witness has been assumed or not excavated enough. And, and the problem is that the Christian witness as it's used by Baltazar and Speyer I think is, is very problematic because it says Christ suffers, I, I then need to suffer. And there's some kind of glorified, um, there's kind of a glorification of that suffering. of his own power so or is, does it require another power for a resurrection the only reason I ask that is, mm. it, is uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of uh, whether it's what the conditions are of the, of the emergence of life out of death you know in, in so far as that's shown in the this three day and that intermediary thing so I'm just trying yeah, to get so what kind of power is operating in, the, in that ascent? For example, does the Father, is he required to bring Christ to life? Is Christ dead? Or, well, or is it the nature of Christ to, to die on the appointed day and then in fulfillment? I don't know how to do this. Yeah, no, well, it's, I mean, it's read, by, it's read by them as a Trinitarian event so that it's not like one has power and one, one doesn't, but that, that the dying and rising are... Um, is an event of God. I mean, that, so there's not... The Trinity? Yeah, the Trinity. I mean, in this tradition, I mean, in this yeah. vein, it would be... So perhaps what... I'm, I'm just asking, you know. Yeah. So perhaps that could one say that the emergence of life out of death arises out of the nature of the Godhead? <coughs> yeah. Um, I mean... It, you are p- picking up on one thing that, that it's true in there. I mean, that, that this drama that they have going on between Father, Son, and Spirit, it really does seem like the Father is rising, you know, is, is raising the Son. You know, the Father is raising the Son. It's a much more, uh, the activities seem much more delineated. Um, I, because 
they're trying to emphasize the drama. So they would be like, the son is dead with the dead in, in, in hell, has no power, is forsaken by the father, um, and is, it's really just an extreme picture of what happens on the cross, although you have a, I, I didn't get into this, I mean, I could, but it, it's a, you know, of the whole vision, he receives a vision of sin, um, the son receives a whole vision of sin. You know, he takes on the sin. In hell, on the second Yeah, he gets a vision of sin as it is in itself, so not uh, um, attached to a particular person, but but a kind of uh, vision of um, of that. And he kind of sees the the dark. They uh, Boltzler calls it the radiant darkness of the father, which is a kind of extreme love, but almost extreme wrath. So he gets to see this the, this kind of mystery of the father's justice and love um, in in hell um, so he, he'll say it's not like the son is damned in hell but he does receive a vision of of kind of sin in its p- purest state um, so the rising power would be that the there'd be kind of an extreme resur- I mean the, the mystery of, of resurrection would be um, even more miraculous, like that, that that the son can rise out of this radical alienation from the father. But they make it, I mean, in their thought, it's much more of a drama, but they would never say that it's not a Trinitarian activity, that it's like the, it's not like one's doing it and the other one has no power. So how they do that would take me, how, how they figure out the three in one would take me a while to kind of explicate, yeah. Is it inevitable? Or, you know, is there any contingency in the narrative? Does one have to do anything? Christ, I'm not following. Does, does Christ clearly have failed on the second day? No, he didn't. He didn't. Could he have not risen? No, not for them. I mean, not according to them here. So in some sense, it's a... Yeah, this is the narrative that has been been given. I mean, they really see themselves as theologically explicating the Gospel of John. I mean, they're deeply biblical theologians, so they'll they'll kind of take the account. Um, You know, this is this is so interesting because Baltazar like resisted systematic theology, although he writes it, which is a kind of perplexing thing. But that that he really believed that theology was deeply biblical theology, and so that his what they wanted most to do was to give a kind of fullness to the Johannine text. Um, and, and in that Johannine text, there's a Jesus appears again to the disciples so that they would see themselves as... And they give the kind of Trinitarian, being in the theological tradition, they give them the Trinitarian reading of that. And if you read the Gospel of John, there's a lot of Trinitarian activity. I mean, there's a lot of Father, Son, and Spirit, the kind of relation between them, you get a lot of that in the farewell discourse in John about the relationship between the Father and the Son in the Spirit. Um, we just have a few more minutes and there's several more questions, so I'm going to suggest that we just hear all the questions and, and then uh, get them all on the table and um, <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> Is that okay? Then I have to choose between them? <laughs> well, you, you may not have time to respond to any of them, but we'll find out what um, what's on people's minds okay. that you may or may not want to follow up on yet. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really intrigued by what you were saying about sort of amplifying the, the low side, if you want to say that, for how we do theology that needs to be expanded in some way. It made me think about origins. And in your own presentation, I'm sensing that you take scripture very, very seriously in the life of the mind, but also that you are attending to life events and, and just on a global scale, what is really relevant. Mm-hmm. And I was curious how you came to challenge what seems to me to be an orthodox of thinking first and then application. It seems sounds like you're providing an opportunity for reversing that somehow. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just following the line of really good feminist and womanist theologians. I mean, who... Um, yeah, you know, the, I, I just love the Bible because it's so confusing. <laughs> and because I do think it's, the, it, it's rhetorically rich and it cannot be condensed into, into a system. So systematic theologians, I mean, it's interesting that, that I, I really do, I find a lot of life there. And it's because I read it, I read these texts now, I cannot help but read them through this 
lens of, of, of trauma, that it just becomes a kind of way that I, that I read. And, and I think a lot, the best feminist and womanist theologians have, have really done that. So I'm just following and following my sisters and, and really taking seriously the fact that I think, um, I mean, trauma is extremely hard to write about and to read and I wouldn't advocate that people spend a lot of time doing it, but I think that theologically, um, I, I think theologically, it's, it's the question of radical suffering to me is like the pressing theological question, and I'm hearing that come at us in this century in a new way, and the complexities of not only you know personal violence but global global trauma. It just, it just I feel like there's no other theological work for me to do but to give some kind of voice to, to what I think is an increasing violent world. Increasingly co complex to understand what that is. So I'm following my sisters, but I'm also recognizing my world is a little different than, than 20 years ago as well. So. Well, I think that's an appropriate note to sum up your presentation of your work. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you. For